Good evening, everyone. I'm Daniel Green. I'm the president at the Newberry Library. Um, welcome to our conversations at the Newberry series, which is now in its ninth season. This series of conversations is an example of the Newberry civic commitment to both education and intellectual engagement. Within the library and across the library, we're seeking many ways to bring together communities of scholars and students and the public to discuss ideas that matter in the world today. Since its first program in 2011, Conversations at the Newberry has been generously sponsored by Sue and Melvin Gray. So I wanna thank the Grays um, for sponsoring this conversation series, including this program tonight. And the Newberry is able to host programs like these free of charge because of generous support from donors like the Grays. And there are many ways that all of you too can support the Newberry. You can visit our exhibitions um, and attend public programs. We have a new exhibition called What is the Midwest um, in our galleries um, this evening. Um, you can bring your friends and, and help spread the word about the Newberry. You can follow the Newberry on social media. You can volunteer at the library. And of course, you can make a donation or a gift to the Newberry's annual fund. And the Newberry staff who are here tonight will be happy to talk to you about any of these opportunities if you want to get more involved in the library. Our subject tonight is an urgent one. Uh, news in Chicago media today and tomorrow, and we've brought together two distinguished journalists with long commitments to Chicago to help us think deeply about this topic. In this installment of Conversations at the Newberry, Rick Kogan and Carol Marine will discuss the broad contours of historical and contemporary journalism in Chicago and reflect on their own experiences as TV, radio, and print reporters. And I want to say that the Newberry is a natural place in Chicago to ask questions about the future of Chicago journalism, in part because it's one of the best places to study the history of Chicago journalism. For more than 70 years, the Newberry has been acquiring manuscripts and archives relating to the history and culture of Chicago and the Midwest, including collections related to Chicago journalism. Here at the Newberry, we house the papers of renowned journalists and critics, including Anne Barzell, Fanny Butcher, Ben Hecht, Bill Mullen, and Mike Royko, to name just a few. We hold the archives of publishers, editors, foreign correspondents, cartoonists, critics, and columnists from the Chicago Daily News, the Chicago Record, the Chicago Sun-Times, the City News Bureau, and the Chicago Tribune, as well as many other local publications. And maybe most immediately relevant to tonight's program, you'll find the personal papers of Rick Kogan, uh, Rick Kogan's father, Herman Kogan, the longtime reporter and critic for the Chicago Daily News here at yes, the Newberry. Not mine yet. Not <laughs> Sorry. Um, there are many important questions to ask about the media in the United States today, and specifically about the media in Chicago. Tonight, Rick and Carol will discuss the state of news in Chicago right now, exploring what Chicago news has become and where it's headed. As veteran journalists, they'll speak to the polarization of the news media in our city and beyond. Are some of the hyper-partisan trends that we see in the news media today entirely new? Or are they continuations of long trends in US and Chicago history? How has the business of media, and especially the contraction of print media, influenced civic culture in Chicago? As international and national news take up so much space, where can Chicagoans turn for diverse, in-depth perspectives on critical local issues? I'm sure that many of you here tonight are familiar with their distinguished work over the years in print, radio, and television news. But let, let me introduce our two guests to you anyway. Rick Kogan is a consummate Chicagoan. Born and raised here, he's been a newspaper man since he was 16. In fact, he had his first byline in the Chicago Sun-Times as, as a 16-year-old. Rick has worked for the Chicago Daily News, Chicago Sun-Times, and Chicago Tribune, where he's currently a senior writer and columnist. He also hosts a popular weekly radio program broadcast nationally, After Hours, with Rick Kogan. And he's authored eight books, many of them about Chicago, perhaps none with a better title than a Chicago Tavern, a Goat, a Curse, and the American Dream. As a Cubs fan, we're all thinking about It is about one of the great book titles of all time. I say self-effacingly as I can. And we're all thinking about the Goat again now that the Cubs season ended on, on Sunday. Um, Rick has been a great friend to the Newberry for many years, speaking at public programs and acting as the master of ceremonies at our annual Bug House Square debates right outside in Washington Park across the street. So we thank Rick so much for being here tonight. Carol Marine is political editor at NBC5 News in Chicago and a regular interviewer for public broadcasting on WTTW Chicago Tonight. In 2016, Carol was named a director of the DePaul University Center for Journalism, Integrity, and Excellence. 
Carol's also local to the Chicago area, having graduated from Palatine High School and the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. She began her journalism career at WBIR-TV in Knoxville, Tennessee, working as a reporter, anchor, and assistant news director. She then moved on to WSM-TV in Nashville, where she was instrumental in the investigative reporting that ultimately led to the ouster and indictment of then-Tennessee Governor Ray Blanton. In 1978, Maureen was hired by the NBC-owned and operated station WMAQ-TV in Chicago, where she worked for almost two decades. From 1997 to 2002, Maureen reported for the CBS news program 60 Minutes and 60 Minutes 2 and the Evening News with Dan Rather. In 2002, Maureen and producer Don Mosley left CBS to, to form an independent documentary company, Marine Corps Productions. They've produced programs for CNN and the New York Times Discovery Channel. Um, and this production company, which is housed at DePaul University, um, in this company they, they um, guide aspiring DePaul journalism students through internships. She's received three George Foster Peabody Awards, two DuPont Columbia Awards, two National Emmys, a George Polk Award, a Gracie, and many other awards. So please join me in welcoming Rick Kogan and Carol Marine. And if if you don't mind, I'll take the privilege of asking the first question, and then they, there will be time. Rick and Carol will talk for about 40 minutes, and then there'll be time for, um, for Q&A with you at the end of the program. But let me launch the first question. As I said, the Newberry is a place where scholars and the public think deeply about information, evidence, and truth. We're often asking in the library, how do we know what we know about the past? I wonder if both of you think that sources of news that Chicagoans trust have changed or even evaporated over time. Is it true that Chicagoans and Americans turn only to sources that confirm their biases? And if so, what can journalists and the public do today to address this challenge? Thank you. Jesus, let's start with an easy question. <laughs> I think that's fascinating. One of the reasons I, I said I would do this is because I adore this woman and respect this woman. And my father's papers are here and Mike Royko's papers are here and some of studs is buried out in the park across the street. And what increasingly troubles me is I sometimes find myself drifting back to the past for role models, for story ideas, because certainly where I am at the Tribune that is sort of grasping, I think, blindly for the most part at future readers, future people who will pay money for journalism, I just simply try to do what I have always done and what my father did and what people like Mike and Carol do. It's becoming a smaller crowd. I don't know what they're teaching in journalism schools these days. I do. <laughs> What's it like being a teacher? In journalism schools, and so here's my producer, Don Mosley, and the co-director of the center is back in the corner of the room. We just had this conversation with, with one of our colleagues today that from the time I was a brand new young reporter, there were veterans, you know, hard drinking, tough talking uh, reporters like Peter Nolan who once said to me when I ran into the newsroom, I have a story about someone who has taken a $500 trip that he didn't list. And he goes, get, look at her, look at her. Isn't that cute? She's all excited about $500. Honey, that's a tip. So I say that to start by saying that We've always lamented that it's not the way it was. It's not as good as it was. We had better times than we do now. I honestly think this is a fantastic time to be in journalism. I'm glad to hear that. It's true, and fake news, I mean, let's think about fake news for a second. I'm at the University of Illinois, a freshman in a dorm, and I turn on the Champaign-Urbana radio. What do I hear? This is HLH Hunt Freedom Talk number three. 35, and it was all Rush Limbaugh before Rush Limbaugh. So the, the fake news concept 
Um, the polarization, I don't think we've seen as much polarization as now, I will say. But I am not a pessimist about news. Neither am I. Neither am I. The, your story about uh, your first encounter in the newsroom on Monday, Lois Willie, who was one of the great uh, journalists in the history of this town. A goddess. Yeah. A goddess. Her memorial service is Monday. I wrote her obituary. I adored her uh, during her life. When she was hired by the Daily News, she was first hired to be the assistant to fashion editor Peg Zwecker. She eventually rose to the level of being one of the two our gals. This is how stories were labeled. Our gal with the Blue Angels. Our gal rides the Chicago River. She eventually went to the editor and said, look, I, I, I really think I have more that I can bring to the paper. And Ritz Fisher, the editor, took a chance, but advised her at the time, OK, I'm going to put you in that newsroom, but don't you let any of these guys ever see you cry. Agreed. Agreed. No, no crying. I have said this to myself, and I have said this to women colleagues of mine having conversations in a bathroom where they're about to come unglued and I say, you put on your lipstick and you comb your hair and you act like you've got a secret that nobody knows. Don't let them see you cry. And that's true to this moment. Well, one of the things that I see and have seen change at the Tribune is no offense to journalism schools. My brother's a graduate, most many people I admire are graduates. But I see a lot of kids coming out of, of journalism schools not willing to pay, as I think we both did, any kind, not understanding there's a ground floor in this business as there is in any kind of corporation. Really, you might have to write obituaries mm -hmm. before you are named a columnist. I see, because of the, the sort of star structure that has hit media in, I think, in maybe the last 20 years where everybody... I'll never forget a guy named Jim Warren, who I admired, was a friend. He was a Washington bureau chief, and he, he sort of made big noise when he was named the Washington bureau chief by going out there and telling a Washington Post reporter, I'm here, I'm here to work. I'm not going to be one of those idiot talking heads on TV, uh, his main uh, target. Yeah, that's why he's not that cute. Being Cokie, well, being Cokie Roberts. But two years in, Jimmy was on TV. Yeah. He was seduced by that, not so much seduced by what I think drives local television reporters, but there is, I think, in our era here, this kind of weird star system that has developed where everybody is, is a cross-media kind of person. Well, but that's, so that's required. And, and just to dial back, when, when Rick and I started, we started in one medium. You know, you weren't doing television, were you? Did you start doing television? No, but I'll tell you a really funny radio story where I almost was seduced. Go ahead. Okay. When, at some point, as, as more and more media outlets were created, more and more choices, it was harder and harder for stations to hang on to their audiences, and that's true to this moment. Absolutely. To this moment. And what's amazing to me is cable gets quoted so much, they have really tiny audiences, but big voice boxes. We can get into that later. But the, the fact is that when I came back um, into, when, when we busted apart the documentary company and started coming back, I decided I would never work for anyone again. And so I went to NBC as a political editor. But I'm also at PBS doing political interviews. I went to the Sun-Times as a columnist. Uh, which was one of the greatest rides that I've ever had. And, and the fact... For, for you and the readers. <laughs> Carol wrote a... It, it's hard writing a column in this town. It is very difficult. There are, there are uh, uh, shadows and ghosts, and Carol did as good a job. I remember I was sitting in Ricardo's the day they made the pitch to you. I wasn't sitting with her, but I heard the pitch. And she was, she was great, and I wish she still did that. Well, but... so. One of the things I decided was I love news. I love news with all my heart. It's kind of like, uh, for some people, it is a kind of religion, and that is true for me. And so I wanted to be able to do the things I wanted to do. I can do political 
short form pieces mostly at NBC. I can do long form at PBS. I could write for the Sun Times. Um, and it was better to be a versatile player. And what we tell our students when they say, I think I want to be in, in broadcast, or I think I want to be in digital or print, you go, kiddo, you have to be in all of them. You have to be able to do all of them. Because these days, if the Washington Post breaks a story on Donald Trump, they will be on MSNBC or CNN that night, and they better know how to do it. They've got to put their story digitally as well as um, in broadcast and print. I mean, you have to do it all, and Rick does it all. I mean, you, we've all had to adapt to that sort of nimble thing that now is the media. When I think you, you have to do it in a way that is not, I think, and I see it at the Tribune, I see it all other places, there is a, that it's easier to do superficial stories, to do quick, I'm not talking about an investigative Washington Post thing that we would all follow up on, but the kind of superficial nature of, oh my God, we've got to get this online because there's a new uh, uh, host of The Bachelorette who went to Nutrier High School. That, to me, is not news. I, I try, and I, I guess I've reached a certain point, I've been around long enough, where they, don't, they will not even ask me to do stories such as that. But somebody but, will, and you... Oh, no, and somebody will. Somebody will do that story. But that's what, especially online, is being fed to. I learned something fascinating about six months ago, that, that there are still 400,000 Sunday print subscribers to the Chicago Tribune, and I, I want The reason is, huh? one of the reasons is if you get a digital subscription, they beg you to take the Sunday paper because of the advertising section, yeah. even if you don't read the Sunday paper paper. See, I think people do still. How many of you get a Sunday paper and read it? It's not bad. You are a, a specific Newberry kind of crowd, but uh, <laughs> uh, I can't go ask that at Gibson's, I don't think. Uh, <laughs> But it, that is the crisis that, that, that newspapers certainly are in. And I think also, you know, conventional network O&Os, the affiliates, uh, it's, th we're, we're dealing with a shrinking market, I the think. The network. I mean, let's remember, yeah. all the network broadcasts, more often than not now, lead with weather. Yep. Why? Because they consider it the ultimate universal story. I personally don't. But, um, but they do. I personally don't either. But, but the fact is that they are also groping for an audience. The, the, where I also take heart, I'll tell you, is, you know, 60 Minutes skews old. Sure. 60 Minutes gets a 13 million person audience on a night. That's, Lester Holt isn't getting that. David, what's his face, Muir, Muir. isn't getting it. Um, the cables certainly are not getting it. And the reason 60 Minutes gets it is because they still tell an original story Stories. well that nobody knew how to ask for. That's the definition of news. They surprise you. They help you along. However, because they are partnered with publishing houses, they also do the obligatory book that comes out of their house. There's a little line saying, mm -hmm. CBS News owns Harcourt Brace. Um, you know, so they're, they're, the purity is, uh, it's a fight for purity. I, I want to ask you, because I think, I, I look back on this, I think the year was 2000, it was a real seminal moment in local news. When you reinvented, you were charged with kind of reinventing the way news was presented when Channel 2 said, and I, at the time I think I even wrote, I was TV critic or fooling around with it, I thought, this is the future of news, and thank God for it. It was long-form stories. It was not weather, weather, weather. It was not gossip. It was something along the lines of what Chicago Tonight is, but long-form journalism as a local news product. Could you talk about that experiment, Carol? Because I, I, I was you know, blindly optimistic and hopeful at the time, saying this could this could change the way news is delivered across the country. It did not. So I quit in 97 because the then vice president of news 
a guy named Joel Cheatwood decided Jerry Springer would be kind of a sexy sort of stunt for the May ratings book. And it was sort of the last straw. There had been others, but, tr but um, Springer was sort of the most easily understandable thing anybody could see. And so I and Ron Majors um, made our last stand and said, we just can't introduce him. I'll never be able to unring that bell with people who think that we have some integrity. I get an offer. I didn't have a job. Out on the street, Hank Price of, C of BBM and Bryant Gumbel, who was joining CBS at the time, both came to me and said, we want you to be a hybrid. We want you to be a network correspondent, and we want you to do WBBM. And I said, OK. And then Hank Price started pushing for, we, I have this idea for a newscast. It's not going to be like anybody else's newscast. You're going to do it solo, and it's all going to be news, and a little bit of weather, and a little bit of sports. And I said, I, you know, I don't trust a lot of news management, and <laughs> I don't know that you're going to be here very long, and I don't want to start something I can't finish. And he swore, and he promised, and he made the commitment. And, uh, and finally, I said yes. Our experiment lasted nine months because why? The week before we launched it, CBS News hired Joel Cheatwood, whom NBC had fired over the Jerry Springer debacle. I knew then that no matter how much optimism I can gather on a given day, we weren't going to be long for this world, but we'd slug it out and try. I will never uh, stop being proud of that nine-month experiment. Yep. It brought the whole newsroom together. It was, um, it was wonderful, and it was hard. And, um, you know, sometimes things don't work out. Sometimes you've got to take a big jump into a, you know, large ocean, and sometimes you drown. But uh, it was worth it. it. That could never work, no. I don't, see, so this is where. Or it may be working in, in, glass in half pockets full. that we don't know. Rick is I'm glass empty. empty. <laughs> so. <laughs> but I'm thinking it may be there are just so many options out there now for, for one to consume news. And that's true. And I'll tell you, our students don't watch television. Yeah, no kidding. Our students don't watch television, and they don't read what we conventionally think of as newspapers. Yeah. And so we say to them, now let me see if I understand this. You want to be me but you don't see me, and you don't watch people who are like me or read people like Rick. They consume it in a different way. One of the things that, but then when they get out in the workforce, suddenly it switches around. Yeah, yeah. Because it's the smart ones who know stuff. Besides being advanced in digital, knowing the technology that we are further behind on, um, and that's why you go to school, uh, and that's why you have um, teachers who maybe can tell you how it was in the day uh, and how it should be and what you need to do. Well, it's interesting. I, I, I interviewed via uh, e email because he is wandering the globe, a man named Paul Salapek. Does that name ring a bell to any of you? He was once a Tribune reporter. He won two Pulitzer Prizes for the Tribune. And he decided after leaving the Tribune in 2013 that what he was going to do was practice what he calls slow journalism, which is kind of an immersive way of encountering interview subjects and the world. And Paul began in Ethiopia in January of 2013 to walk, and we'll emphasize that again, walk around the world. It is called the Out of Eden Walk, following what he has determined with other scientists are the path of mankind all the way around the world. PBS has covered him, right? I mean, they've done pieces on Pieces, I mean, yeah. it, it, it's seven, it was supposed to take seven years. It has been, it will be in January, seven years, and he just walked across the border from India to Myanmar. Wow. But what he is producing, and this is a good example. T take a look at the Out of Eden walk. You can find National Geographic. He is writing stories 
frequently. He is doing video. He is doing photography. He is doing audio. And it seems, I mean, there's a nice hook to this because a lot of people think Paul is out of his mind, frankly, that he's nuts. But it is, I think, in some fashion, a future of journalism. And I think the concept of slow journalism, meaning in-depth reporting, you know, a lot of reports, and you see it on, on the evening news, I mean, the network news, it's like, wow, let's fly into Hong Kong, we'll take a shot of a guy getting shot in the chest, it's really bad here, and we'll fly out. It's not the learning experience, it's not the in-depth kind of thing that I think is of great value. You read, you read The New Yorker, you get in-depth stuff. It's out there if you want it. But we, that's why there is also the evolution of ProPublica. Yeah, sure. WBEZ, some of what we're working on at Chicago tonight. There are places, and some of them are digital, and, and, and there's some very young reporters. Yep. Um, but they're, the reason Joe Berrios is no longer the Cook County assessor or the head of the Cook County Democratic Party is because Little Pro Publica launched, had a data, data journalist mm -hmm. named Sanja Kampabadi who went and filed a million FOIAs and created a database to figure out why property assessments were gouging poor people and benefiting rich people. And that story upended. No question. And that, that, to my mind, too, investigative reporting is another example of slow journalism. It is not all, I mean, if you talk to any executive at the Tribune, uh, they, are, they are hooked on the number of hits stories get, and, you'll, and it'll get a hit if it's a celebrity or something, but the slow journalism that we're now both talking about and admiring in so many ways, it's all, it's out there if you want it. I mean, I think we're, we're caught in this kind of, you know, the you know, Fox News, CNN tussle, and that's not what it's about. I think smart people, and I'm thinking mostly because you still read and get a print newspaper, you are smart people. You have to be, I think it's a time when people have to be much more discriminating about what they consume. Can I ask you a Royco question? A Royco question? A Royco question. Because for some of us, and I know this is true for Rick. How many of you remember Mike Royko? Okay. Why aren't you still getting a newspaper then? <laughs> <laughs> I've heard that from people, believe me. Royko doesn't write anymore. Why should I read the Tribune? So growing up in Chicago, Rip, Rick grows up in a newspaper family. I grow up in a, in a blue collar family that buys every newspaper. My dad, who was a political organizer and a bartender and a hardware salesman, the thing he did when Chicago had four newspapers was yeah. he brought, bought all four every day. God love him. And the National Observer once a week and brought him home. But we would fight, first and foremost, for the Chicago Daily News and Mike Royko because each of us wanted to read Royko first. And I can remember my father saying, he called me Annie, you know, Annie, this guy writes five times a week. He hits it out of the park two out of five times. That's impossible. That's really hard. And so Royko was, in my formative years, way before I ever thought I would be a journalist or knew it, Royko was my education. And, and, and I know he was your dear, dear friend. Do you have a sense of what would Royko, if, if Royko were here and a little younger, would, would Royko be adapting or would he just say to hell with it? Uh, he would not be adapting. Even in the early days, I remember sitting in Mike's office and, and you know, one of his leg people or leg creatures assistant. <laughs> leg, leg, once he got a woman there, he'd start to call them leg creatures instead of leg men. Uh, rush into the office, Mike, Mike, Ted Koppel's on the phone. He wants you to be on Nightline. And Mike gets on the phone with Ted Koppel, and well, you read the column. Uh, uh, well, why would I come on your show? Well, but you read the column. Why would I come on the show to talk about what I wrote and what people can read? Mike was not, and I know it was early on, Mike died in 1997, he was not at all seduced by this. I mean, Mike had 
personal reasons for not wanting to go on TV and radio, but I do not, he would be tweeting, and he might even be on Facebook because he was an early adopter of the internet. At, at one point, he, up in his house, he shows, he shows me the internet for the first time. I go, wow, this is great. He's got you a- know Al Gore? Huh? No, yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> Mike invented it before Al Gore did. But he's up there and, and he's showing me a Tribune website on which people could comment early, very early on, very crude. And he, he goes, look at this. I see his column on the screen. I go, that's fantastic. And then I see comments below. And one comment is from some guy saying, I don't understand what you're saying in this column. And answering this man is Eric Zorn, the then young columnist, who was a real early adopter of, of all social media, saying what I think Mike meant was blah, 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 <laughs> blah, 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 blah. And Mike takes a sip of a drink and he types after that, gee, thanks, Eric, what's next? A shared byline? I think Mike would have fought the urge, but again, Kerry, it's hard to say because he was of such a different time. I mean, Studs wasn't using a computer, and you know what I mean? I think a young Mike Boyko, God, if there were such a thing, I don't know. if The way Mike came up, Mike was, you know, paralyzed by various insecurities about his lack of formal education. I mean, I certainly think he, he might have been seduced by this point to write, a, write the novel he never wanted to write. But do you want, can you actually see, Mike did very little TV. Well, and I was on the set when he did yeah. some of it. Um, and, and he was snarly. I mean, oh, you know, yeah. and you know, here's my idol. Here's my idol. And the sound guy's putting a microphone on him and, and his hands are shaking because he's, he's miking up Mike Royko. <laughs> And, uh, and he said, you know, Mr. Mr. Royko, I just can't tell you. And Royko said, yeah, yeah. I mean, he was not, he, he was not a social worker. Um, and, but, and here's, here's, the, here's the other part of it, though, that I also remember. We were at Rich Daly's headquarters when he was running against Bernie Carey for state's attorney. And it was a very long night. And the polls had given it to Bernie Carey, the Republican. And Royko is on ABC 7's set. And he's got one of those watches, you know, one of those watches with a calculator. And, you know, he's going like that. And he says to the, the anchors, tell your pollster to quit or fire him. He's wrong. Give me the precincts. And he did the numbers. He knew the numbers. Yeah. He knew which wards were out. He knew which precincts would turn for Daly, which ones would turn for Kerry. It wasn't until 4 o'clock in the morning, and, and at being at Daly's headquarters, they were none too pleased with the media. I was about to be thrown off the platform I was on by drunk Bridgeport firemen until, until our courier and, and producers were grabbing me. You know, Royko had all of that information that really good reporters have. He had really good sources. And, and, the reason, and, he, he, and he wasn't averse to television. I think he hated, well, there was one particular anchor he hated. Walter. 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 And, 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 <laughs> and, and, and famously and, hated. And, and couldn't get over that Walter made that much money. And so, I mean, I think part of, of his aversion to those on sort of my side of the street at the time, though he was very nice to me. He was um, very nice to Carol. He was very nice to me. But um, his aversion was, what the hell is that guy doing making that much money and I'm not? So, I mean. Yeah, the money, the money always got to him, that's for sure. I mean, that's for sure. Things are personal. You know, we all, things get personal for all of us. But one of the things, and you bring this up interestingly with Mike, is at, at one point in television and in print, there was a period of, of training after journalism school, kind of on the job, getting to know. No, there wasn't. Yes, there was. So there I was get hired into, I wasn't in journalism. I didn't go to journalism Neither school. did I. Okay, so we, we get there. And I have had a number of jobs. 
in virtually every one of my jobs, and my colleagues who've had a number of jobs, you get the job and they say, you know, we're going to give you a week or two to ease in. Get to know the territory. You know, we're going to show you the equipment. It's, you know, and then we'll put you out on the street. You get there and they go, the school down the road's on fire. Get out there and, and do it. I mean, I'll I give you, no, I'll trained. give you that, but I think the best reporters that I have met and continue to meet are the people who go out and explain. It may not be assignment, it may not be on assignment, but they want to get, they have that curiosity that drove studs, they have that curiosity that drives anybody, especially plunked into a new environment. They'll go on an off day or a day off, not to the health club, or well, nobody goes to bars anymore, <laughs> to the health club, uh, they, they will go see what a trial is like at the criminal courts building, whether they, that is their beat or not. There are still those people out there. Uh, there is no question about it. They will go to people like Carol and me and ask questions about there used to be, there was a kind of, especially in newspapers, a kind of nurturing that, that people were not worried about the young guy coming on and the young guy could go to Lois Willie and say, Miss Willie, could you talk to me about, uh, you know, about the public housing? And you could get that, it's beyond the journalism school. It's on the way, it's not training by any formal way. And now we have, you know, the meetings I'm telling you about, you know, at the <laughs> Tribune next week, there's a, you know, hey, please come to this, uh, the seminar about headline writing, and I'm thinking, you know, a lot of these people's parents spent hundreds of thousands of dollars to send them to journalism school, and if they don't know how to write a headline by now, they're never going to learn how to write a headline. But that kind of, it takes, it, 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 it's the people who wind up being good at their jobs. You, you have ever been a curious person, and I know that you went to people and said, hey, could you tell me about this without feeling embarrassed or feeling young when we were young. Can I say a word about Lois Willie? Sure. So Lois Willie, um, when I joined the Sun-Times, you know, and I was a TV people, person going to print, usually print people go to TV, not the other way around. And I had some misgivings. And, and for about a year or so, I wrote a once a week in the, in the Tribune uh, before I went to the Sun-Times. I didn't know, after all those years of never giving my opinion, never, never signing a petition, which I still don't do, you know, never I'm following the rules of reporting that you keep yourself out of it and you don't insert your views. Did I think that I could do it? And um, I call Lois, mm. and I say, you know, I don't know if I can can jump into that. I'm a little, you know, I'm a, I'm a reporter first. And she has this sort of Pulitzer Prize voice. It's like, well, Carol. She has two of them. She's got two of them, yeah, like, like earrings. <laughs> um, she said, you know, some people can never cross over the bridge. Mm. It's true. But I think you can. And I'll make sure to read you and help you, which she did. And so I fire off a bunch of columns, and then I'd go have lunch with her, and with Judy Royko. We'll go get um, uh, oysters, Rockefeller, and a little wine, and and Lois will kind of talk about what she liked, what she didn't. She, but she was never in kind of a judgmental way. She was, a, I mean, when I say she was a goddess to me. She was a goddess to me because she was generous. She was so helpful, she, but she never pushed an agenda on me ever. It was always, it was constructive. I mean, I got a lot of mentoring from Lois too when I was at the Daily News, and it was always constructive. Uh, judgmental, never. You enjoyed writing a column, did you not? I loved writing a column, but it was one of the hardest things I've ever done. Um, and the thing, so I wrote twice a week in the Sun-Times. The Sun-Times also allowed me to report. Mm -hmm. um, this is something that uh, the Tribune doesn't. The Tribune really does. They call it an analysis that a reporter writes, which oh, yeah. is really a column, yeah. but they pretend that there's that separation. Don Hainer, who was my executive editor and a guy I, I adore to this day, said, 
I don't care if I know where you're coming from. I'll judge your reporting, though, by whether I think yeah. it's been perverted by that. And uh, so I was allowed to do investigative reporting, um, w largely with Tim Novak and Chris Fusco. And we partnered, they, they partnered with NBC. So uh, Don and I would produce a story, they would print a story, we'd launch it at the same time. It's very hard to do these partnerships, but we did. Um, but I loved writing a column, and this is m my last word on this. My first boss was Steve Huntley. Steve Huntley, sure. the Southern gentleman, um, and I, he said, what are you writing today? And I'd give him the idea, and he'd go, oh, that's interesting, okay. And I'd turn it in. Steve Huntley retired um, a number of years before I left the Sun-Times and started writing his own column. I remember Mark Brown and I sitting down to lunch with him and both of us saying, we had no idea how conservative you are. You never did that in the newsroom. You never did, you know, and we wrote columns that I am sure he disagreed with. But he was there for all the right reasons and to be a good boss who allowed, you know, some wide thinking. And I think that is, when people tell me, oh, I know, they tell you what to do and what to write and what to say, uh, that hasn't happened in my career, and it didn't happen with Steve Huntley. You know, part of it, as, we, as we're talking here, I'm getting a, you see my glass is full now. Uh, <laughs> I, I'm, getting, I'm getting a renewed faith in this whole thing. As much as we can talk about the people running these businesses, there are always going to be in this bus these businesses people who care about delivering the news. It may be someone who cares, you know, look at a guy like Roger Ebert who cares about delivering movie reviews, that's great. I think, I, I have a new sense, you've given me, Carol Marine, a new sense of kind of confidence, even as, as media splinters and continues you know, to splinter in ways. I have a 15-year-old daughter who, who said, she saw me working the phone one day, she goes, Dad, do you really still use Twitter? And I said, my God, they make me do this at work. You know, don't you do this? No, only text. And who knows? I mean, that's one of the fascinating things, too, about where this is going to go. I think Carol addressing the kind of partnerships that are available out there the kind of pro publica, the kind of collaborative efforts. And it's up to you to be kind of discerning about it. You know what I mean? And read, yeah. and we say this to our students all the time, you've got to read the people you don't like. And yeah. one day in class, um, we insist that they know the names of the people who write and report. You've got to know their bylines. If you want to be known when you go out there. You want people to know your name. You certainly have to know theirs. So we go around the class and say, who do you read? What do you read? Give me some bylines from the Trib, the Sun-Times, um, from some of the broadcasts. And one kid said, I asked if um, he read David Howe in the Tribune, a sports writer I love, and he said, no, I don't like him because um, he's not good to Notre Dame. And, and I said... The myopia of certain you know, readers. Honey, get a grip. The, he's a great writer, and yeah. he's a great reporter, and he's fearless in his sports reporting. And um, you should be reading everybody, not just the people that you happen to like. And even at this stage, you got to keep hammering that home again and again, that you have to read what you don't like. You have to listen to what you don't expect to hear or you don't believe um, and it, you know our listening skills I think need working on all the time yeah and in this in that fashion this is an amazing time to be a consumer of media I mean you can create your own radio station you can with podcasting you can you the listener you can create your own newspaper from various read 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 watch 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 Listen, listen, listen. And you're getting so optimistic, it's adorable. <laughs> <laughs> you know? but, but it is, it is true. 
And um, the problem is monetizing it. Yep. I mean, because we, Rick and I, have been lucky to make a very good living for a long time in the business. And it's harder and harder to do that. Um, and, and so, and our, our students, I think all young people, are impatient. They have their first job at a little newspaper or a small TV station, and, and they know they're ready for Meet the Press. And do I need an agent? And I think I need a stylist. I mean, I, what? So, you know, but that's, that is, yeah, sure, that that's is in the nature of... Youthful ambition. Youth, yeah. Youthful ambition. But, um, but the money is a tough thing. And so, uh, some of our students will join a, a small newspaper or uh, a small TV station, and the salaries can be as low as twenty-three or twenty-five thousand a year. Now that's kind of food stamps. I yeah. mean, if you're going to if you're going to rent a house or rent an apartment, even with a roommate, if you're going to occasionally um, go out with friends for a hamburger. I mean, it's, it is really struggling. Um, the, it gets better as you go up, you know, the chain, but, um, but we also try to help them, therefore, with their contracts, yeah. something I've had a little experience with. Now, how do you people feel? Glass half empty, full. Fuller than when you walked in here? <laughs> That's a perfect transition for um, some audience questions. See, that's kind of like a newscast, that seamless transition. Nice yes, voice wait, now it. the weather, please. Wait, one moment. Carol and I will deliver the weather report. I have a question just on print journalism right now. And I, a print, germ, print journalism as opposed yeah. to digital. And I, I will tell you, I, I grew up delivering the Sun-Times and Tribune in the morning. And I have probably been a subscriber, daily subscriber to the Tribune for 35 years. Nowadays, when I pick up the paper, I wonder whether there's something missing. And... Saturday is like the worst of all, of course. But yeah, they're going to dump Saturday I guess my question really is, is it inevitable that one of these days, the Trib and the Sun-Times or both, are going to go out of business and the owners are going to blame the readers no. for not supporting them? What's and the readers happen? are going to say, if you gave us more substance, we might still be here reading your papers. Well, there's going to be somewhere along the line where it's going to be financially unfeasible to keep cutting down trees in Canada, making it into pulp. That, that's the expense of a newspaper. I do not find, except for maybe so far, the New York Times and the Washington Post doing it, to my mind, an acceptable online job of producing their products. I think uh, those two are doing it right. I think it is inevitable, perhaps in my lifetime, given my lifestyle, uh, I, I may not see that, but, but it, it is inevitable. And I think the, pro, the online, now the Sun-Times, I, I can't do it. I can't do the Sun-Times and I can't do the Tribune. The Sun-Times has gotten, is yeah. on, is, the it's, online's gotten better. And frankly, the Saturday paper. Yeah, they have a, this new. This is yeah, a plug I for Chris Cusco, who, who is now the executive editor, and I love him. And, and, and frankly, I love the Sun-Times. Um, I think their, their Saturday sports, is beautifully written, beautifully photographed. They're actually including women's sports, my yeah. God. Um, and their investigative stuff, I think, is strong, and their columns are strong. They're, and their website has gotten better, but it was, it was a horrific oh, it was. website for, for too long, and they are, you know, they are really changing that. But then once you've <laughs> lost somebody, it's hard to pull them back, um, and that's part of the challenge of of all of these places. And it's the habit, it's of changing your habits, it's of giving you something that is a facsimile of the reading experience that you got from a real paper and you don't get that online, uh, sadly. You see how much time people spend because they're doing all these analytics and all this other, frankly, sorry, bullshit about time spent with, you're saying, well, someone, oh, look, someone clicked on my story. And they spent 13 seconds? <laughs> you know, I don't write 10,000 words, but 13 seconds? Or you read the lead and you didn't go on? I, I think it is inevitable that, uh, that, that print will vanish. But, you know, they said the same thing about books 10 years ago. Ooh, the Kindle's out here. No one's going to publish books anymore. We have another question back here. 
Hi, Christine Kappel. I work in public relations and went into it to tell stories and work with journalists. But I have a question, um, if you don't mind sharing what young journalists in Chicago you are admiring now and think that we should keep an eye on for their power of storytelling. Easy. We Rachel Hinton at the Sun-Times, Jessica Villa Gomez at sure. the Tribune, two of our students um, uh, who are doing a fine job. Um, uh, Emmanuel Camarillo at the Chicago Sun-Times. I think Will Lee at the, an African-American at the Chicago Tribune. He covers courts mostly, but he, he is branching out a bit. Very talented reporter, Jeremy Gorner. Jer I was going to say Jeremy Gorner, Annie Sweeney. Yep. Um, I still think of Mark Brown as young, even though he's <laughs> may have, he, may have, yeah. he may have crossed the yeah. Rubicon. But, um, but there are lots of eager, Young reporters, I mean, they, are they green? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Jeremy Gorner is no longer are, green. Well, and uh, are the best of them willing to learn? Yeah, yeah, and they have, and they do, and so there's there are some really great ones. Um, what, uh, Greg Pratt at the. Oh yeah, Greg Pratt now yeah, covering City good. Hall and City you know, Council and Lori Lightfoot. On one of my favorite topics, Ed Burke. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and um, and so I mean, there you know, there's. But also to Carol's point, I don't know if she sees it as much in television, but I have watched in the last couple of years some very, very talented, a guy named uh, Jason George and a number of other people, who very talented reporters who can't make. They want to get married. They want to have kids. They leave. Mm -hmm. And this kid was as talented or he spoke seven languages, wanted to be a foreign correspondent, was a terrifically talented reporter here. He wanted to get married. The Tribune would not, would not nurture him the way they should have, and now he's writing for television. Not new, he's writing TV shows. Yeah. But that's part of the, what Carol addressed, that $25,000. You know, Try doing that, try having four roommates for four years and fall in love and think about a family, and you're like, can I have a raise? And it's, oh, we haven't given any raises here in eight years. <laughs> that's true. Next question's right here. Uh, this is more of a thank you than a question. My late husband, Bill Birch, was a oh. news oh, hound. Oh, Bill. Birch, and who NBC knew both of you and had the utmost man. respect for all of you and came from the news family, his father, himself, his son. Um, and Bill, when we used to watch the news, Bill would just rue the fact. When you were talking about the long stories, because Bill started out in the infancy of TV news, start, you know, started and ran the network news bureau here, three, one of three network cameramen, lived next door to you, and old town. Uh, <laughs> you know, but he used to just bemoan the fact that there were no stories. It was all um, sound bites. And he used to get very frustrated with that. It's like, you know, I, there, he didn't feel there was any storyline. And I know you addressed that before, but I was wondering how you felt about that. <laughs> well, I get frustrated because and I, video, in many ways, the accessibility of video has, has, has damaged uh, local news. I was watching this morning after sitting through five minutes of weather for the fourth time in the time it takes me to get dressed, going, oh, and in, uh, in Pakistan, a bridge collapsed. And I'm watching 35 seconds of a bridge collapse in Pakistan. I'm like, why am I watching this? Why, why do I need to know? There are no more details about it, if anyone was killed or injured. It's the new definition of a foreign story. Yeah, um, yeah. But but to, you, but to your point, and, and, and Bill and I have had some of these conversations, and we've had a little disagreement on some of them, because after, after he stopped doing some of that, his son Randy Birch, who I worked with for a long time and loved, um, with his camera, just what he'd learned from his father, he turned that camera into a poetry machine. Mm -hmm. And whether we were covering a prison riot or we were covering, um, you know, Vietnam uh, soldiers who fled to Canada. Randy um, and Bill had this enormous talent and great eye. And I think um, after when Randy proceeded, and, and he's um, not with us now, but I think there's been storytelling. Um, but I do think that sometimes we get to um, fond of how it used to be. I look at my old memos, you know, in the, in the glory days of news, and I think, Jesus, 
I was complaining then about what I'm complaining about now. So I think there is um, some selective memory. Another question here. Thank you for doing the presentation. Um, the Newberry Library has documents and books and various things that are five and six hundred years old. This is an extraordinary thing, and it, it just is, uh, I mean, we love the Newberry because of that. How do you see, in a digital age, your words, your ideas, and things being preserved for the next two, three hundred, maybe four hundred years? Danny and we were talking about this um, in what they call the green room. It's really very beige. Um, but <clears throat> the, for instance, I have, I have hundreds, thousands of tapes in all different generations of tapes. I have old film. I don't know where it is anymore. Um, but there is, um, Tom Weinberg has Media Burn Archive. He's trying to, to record some of that. I mean, it's, a lot of it's being lost because, in my case, TV stations, and actually in, in print, too, they're killing their libraries, they're throwing out mm -hmm. their clip files, they're dumping their video, and so we have lost an enormous amount. I've tried to donate my stuff where I think somewhere, somebody, someday, if they want to see it, can see it. And the Media Burn Archive is actually, if you haven't pulled it up, on, you know, they, they, you can't dub the stuff that they have they, because it's copyrighted and all of that, but you can watch it. Yeah, mediaburn.org, run by Tom Weinberg. But it's a challenge. I mean, it's, this isn't going to be easy. You know, eventually, there, <laughs> with all the media, it's going to be a mountain that no one can climb. But... Before the Tribune went bankrupt, it did, it did archive online its archives back to 1845, which is quite a thing to see and behold. And they, it's good, too. You type in something in the historical archive, and you will find it. And you will find it, the great best thing about it, the way it appeared in print. You will see how it appeared in print. So it's going to, again, this is a lot of this stuff all boils down to money. You know, who is going to pay to archive, you know, no one's going to archive my radio shows, but, but to archive all the media coming out every minute of every day and archive and catalog, I don't know. And I don't want all my stuff archived. Likewise. <laughs> I mean, seriously, I'd like to have a hand in picking and choosing here um, because a lot of it is not really worth its historical significance. All right, so we're going to wrap it up after one last question, which is over here. Hi, thank you. This is a great night. Um, last night on Facebook, I read that two CTA bushes crashed on Lakeshore Drive. <laughs> Yes, yes. That being said, how is editing going on nowadays? Is it the same intensity? Is there different editing going on social media than there is in the articles? Mm. No, I, part, it's the speed. It's just the, the crazy speed that you're hitting send before you've spell checked it or reread it because you want to be first. Uh, and because these different organizations put it up on big electronic boards, you know, did MAQ break this? Did the TRIB break this? Uh, how many hits has it gotten? I mean, part of it is just the, the death-defying speed. And, and one of the things we try very hard to teach is it is better to be right than oh. to be first. Absolutely. And, and you know, that it's hard to learn, and when you've gotten beaten on a story you think you already had, hadn't nailed down the last whatever, you, you know, as my mother used to say, a devout Catholic, offer it up. Because, you know, <laughs> you, you, you just got to keep on going. Well, be careful out there because there are 800 trillion stories in this naked, <laughs> naked city so we have. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.